Greetings, and welcome to Jones Day Talks Healthcare and Life Sciences. I'm Ann Hollenbeck. And I'm Courtney Carroll. And I'm really excited because today we're kicking off our podcast series on hot topics in healthcare. We've polled all the Jones Day healthcare attorneys on what the most exciting, newsworthy legal events were over the past month or so, and we get to share those with our clients in this podcast. So hot topics we're covering today include vertical mergers, false claims act development, a new advisory opinion from the OIG concerning gain sharing, and some updates on association health plans. So Courtney, let's dive right in. All right. So first, Courtney, let me just say I was really surprised at the news we got last week. I read an article published January 30th that Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan are coming together in some sort of venture for the benefit of their employees. Yeah, I I heard about that, too. I was really excited and I'm intrigued to see what particularly Amazon might bring in terms of new technology and abilities to reduce the cost of healthcare. In the days following the initial announcement, there were many questions about the scope of the joint venture. I saw some quotes from Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan stating that the JV's focus will be on the healthcare quality and cost of the joint ventures employees, so somewhat limited in scope. It kind of reminded me of um, the the sense that that I have of this new wave of vertical mergers in the healthcare industry. For example, that proposed CVS health court merger um, with Aetna announced earlier in December worth $69 billion. Whew, that is not a small merger. (laughs) So, like you, um, you know, I've been thinking mergers generally ho- are horizontal mergers, hospitals right. merging with another hospital, two other types of providers. But this CVS Aetna merger seems really unique. Yeah, I thought the same thing, that it's what does this mean that you've got a pharmacy company, pharmacy benefit manager uh, joining forces with what we know as a traditional health insurer? So what, do you have any thoughts on kind of what this means for the healthcare industry more broadly? Well, certainly, if it comes to fruition, I think a deal like this could be an indicator of a market shift that would affect all of our healthcare clients. It could be a new way of reducing costs while also creating better care with lower premiums. It's really, in this case, about a supplier and then a customer joining forces to coordinate across their business lines. Yeah, well, it's going to be very interesting to see if that ends up going forward and, and really what this does mean for our healthcare clients in the market more generally. Um, and then, as you said, how that connects with Amazon Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan's venture, um, focusing on their employees, but I think maybe with an eye towards reducing healthcare expenditures overall. Let's move to the False Claims Act. Fill us in on the latest. So, as, of course, you know, every year the Department of Justice announces its general False Claims Act recoveries, and they recovered more than $3.7 billion from all False Claims Act cases in 2017. So, interestingly, for our clients, of that 3.7 figure, 65%, or $2.4 billion, came from healthcare settlements or healthcare cases. Uh, so again, as we've seen in years past, the healthcare sector is representing the majority of the recoveries. And it's also interesting to note that throughout the years, these numbers continue to go up. We saw uh, 2017 showed slightly less in terms of dollar amounts from recoveries than 2016, but nonetheless, the 2017 figure still exceeded what we've seen in most recent years. So the general trend has shown that there are going to be more and more and more False Claims Act recoveries. What other trends are shown in this data? Yeah, so one of the things that we talk a lot about in the industry is the percentage of relator cases and sort of what is the government's involvement in these and which ones are spearheaded primarily um, by individual relators. And of the $3.7 billion recovery from 2017, approximately $3.4 billion, or 92%, wow. yeah, came from cases initiated by relators. So it's definitely independent, driven, independently driven by these individual relators. 
Um, and the other interesting thing from 2017 was that this was the largest year ever for recoveries in cases where the government declined to intervene. Oh, so wow. Historically, it used to be that if you could get the government to decline to intervene, the case was likely not going to go anywhere. And that's just not the case anymore. We're seeing more and more sophisticated relators who are coming with real concrete evidence and the government just doesn't have time to be involved in all of them, but that doesn't mean that the case isn't significant or a real risk to uh, the potential defendant. That reminds me, Courtney, of the recent report of an internal DOJ memo discussing the dismissal of meritless key TAM cases. Yeah, that's exactly right. They There was a, a leaked memo where the DOJ was speaking about how its attorneys should use its authority, which it, it rarely uses historically, but it does have the authority to ask for meritless key TAM false claims act cases to be dismissed. And so different people have been opining about, does this mean that the DOJ is now going to actually dismiss more cases that it thinks are meritless? Or um, is this just sort of putting the information out there for political gain? Who knows what, why this was released now? Um, and frankly, I don't think it's something that uh, defendants can really rely upon at this stage, but it does suggest that there may be the potential for the government to actually try to dismiss some of the really meritless relator cases. You know, these are really interesting statistics and the the, the leak, leaked memo, as you called it. You know, I remember when um, we had the change in presidential administration, there was there was some hope that there would be a significant decline in false claims activity, that prediction or perhaps hope does not seem to have come to pass. That's exactly right. Regardless of who's in the White House, it seems that False Claims Act cases are frankly a way in which the government is generating revenue, and so they're going to continue to pursue those cases, it would appear. Now, a couple things that have come out um perhaps related to the political party that's in power. But, of course, there was the recent tax reform, and it's important for our clients to know that as part of that, there were some significant changes to the deductibility of settlement payments. And the nuances of that are very detailed, and we don't have time to get into it now. But if any of our clients listening are currently in the middle of a False Claims Act investigation or settlement, they should consult with their tax attorneys about how to negotiate the the way in which the settlement's paid, if their settlement is actually going to be tax deductible or not, because that's going to be potentially a very critical issue going forward that, like I said, the, the tax reform did change. Yeah, as I understand it, the the deductibility of settlement payments when computing income tax can only be deducted to the extent that the payments for restitution or actually pays to bring the company into compliance with the law. So it's more nuanced and will require more attention by taxpaying clients. And one other thing on the False Claims Act um, side, we do see a lot of these stemming from Stark Law violations. And historically, there have been talk about, well, is this a technical violation or a substantive violation? Uh, and there's been a lot of angst and anxiety over Stark Law and how it's continued to be enforced, even in an era where we're moving from uh, fee-for-service to more value-based payments. And interestingly, CMS did announce recently that they're forming an interagency group to discuss Stark Reform and particularly how it pertains to cases where you or circumstances where you have uh, sort of more of a value-based uh, payment system and, and what that looks like. What do we need in a Stark Reform to try to facilitate these types of payment mechanisms. And I, CNS also indicated that at some point, Congress is probably going to need to step in, and there have been some discussions on the Hill about this as well. But uh, it's interesting to note that the CMS administrator has, has now initiated this interagency group to try to look at what regulatory barriers might be able to be minimized purely within the regulatory framework without Congress acting um, in, in an effort to push towards value-based payments. Well, that's something we will obviously be um, watching very closely and um, reporting here on our podcast series for our clients. I look forward to hearing more about it, that's for sure. Yes, I've um, been on the Hill talking with some congressmen about Stark, and there there are some folks out there that are very interested. So if 
um, if our clients listening have a particular interest in this, I absolutely recommend contra- contacting your congressman. There are a number of people who are interested in this on the Hill, uh, including congressional staffers from both parties. So I would absolutely recommend making your interest in Stark Reform known um, to your local congressman. And so speaking of looking at value-based payments and how the healthcare industry is changing as a result of those, I heard that there was a favorable OIG opinion regarding gain sharing that came out recently. That's right. At the end of December, the OIG issued opinion number 1709, which gave approval to a gain sharing arrangement for cost reduction measures in designated neurosurgical procedures. So this one is a, is, is in keeping with ones we've seen over recent years. Um, it, it's, it's out there in large part because such an arrangement implicates both the civil monetary penalties law and the anti-kickback statute because the government's concerned these sort of gain sharing programs could give physicians the incentive to withhold medically necessary care or even to steer patients to certain hospitals so that they can achieve those right. savings and therefore those payments. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So what, so given that context, what made this particular arrangement low risk in the government's eyes? Yeah. So a couple things about the payment themselves. First of all, the payments don't exceed 50% of the total savings. So only 50% goes to the physicians. The physicians are then paid on a per capita basis. And the, the payments are capped based on the number of procedures performed by the physicians. The other unique thing about this is that the parties together annually rebase the savings benchmarks so that improper duplicate payments to physicians is prevented. Mm, that makes sense. So it's not that you can get the same, you can get multiple payments for having cost reductions year after year after year. You've got to, make sure that you're actually reducing it from the year prior. Exactly. And what about the patients in this arrangement? Do they have any sort of notice that they're physicians? Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Payment? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So one of the safeguards is that the hospital and the physicians provide the patients with written notice that the arrangement and compensation exists. Ah, okay. And That's this must good. include the fact that the physician will receive a percentage of the hospital's cost savings. That makes sense. They're kind of similar to how physician-owned hospitals have to disclose that there's a physician ownership to patients. You got it. Great great example of something similar. So the then, other, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was going to just say another unique thing is that the hospital and the physicians um, together have an oversight committee that, that bird dogs all of this. Um, and I want you to know that the physicians were involved in conducting a specific evaluation and review of the vendors and the products. Ah. to determine what what would be considered standard. And uniquely, the physicians have um, access to the exact same selection of devices and supplies before the arrangement as after the arrangement. So there's there's no um, special formulary, so to speak. The physicians still have the same choice. It's simply that products have been evaluated and there's knowledge about what is standard, what's considered clinically safe, what's considered effective. Um, so I thought that was an interesting piece of this puzzle. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it really, you're, you're still making sure that the practice of medicine is in the physician's hands to choose which device is appropriate. But if there is a less expensive device that would be medically appropriate for that patient, then the physician's going to uh, have the ability to achieve some of those savings and benefit from those as well personally. Okay, so Courtney, last topic up, Uh, you're going to talk to us about association health plans and uh, the new rules that came down earlier in January. Fill us in. Yes, so the Department of Labor published a proposed rule to reduce the regulatory requirements for association health plans. And if this is finalized, the rule could lead to an increase in these association health plans at potentially a lower cost to the participants, but also maybe less generous benefits um, than current small group health plans. So this is also sort of a potential shift in the marketplace that we're seeing uh, as a result of, of these proposed rules. And I think the, the key thing to note is that if you want to comment on that, the comments are due by March 6th. So make sure you've got about another month or so to get in those comments, but make sure that 
if you have a comment on on how these function and, and the reduction in the regulatory requirements for these plans, you need to get those in soon. And the way that these historically have worked is that they these various associations might be a Farm Bureau, Chamber of Commerce, different entities have provided opportunities for their members to have insurance through the association, but they were highly restrictive. Um, there was some ERISA limits about whether or not the association could be treated as a single employer, and the proposed rule is going to expand the definition of employer under ERISA so that more types of associations may be considered as single large employers uh, and potentially have be eligible for less burdensome large group market rules instead right. of some of the more burdensome rules that apply to individuals. Got it. I was going to say, so a lar- the larger employer rules are more flexible. That's right. And so from our client side, there may be some providers or life sciences companies out there that are small employers and might be willing or interested in participating in one of these association health plans instead of having to cover your employees just yourself negotiating uh, with you and your six employees you may be able to perhaps benefit from a larger population of insured persons through joining with in with one of these associations i think perhaps more likely the scenario for for more listeners of the podcast is on the provider side you may end up seeing a decrease in reimbursement due to less generous benefits and potentially higher cost sharing for patients. So those providers should be aware that that this change in the insurance market could be forthcoming. Uh, They may also want to look into becoming a preferred provider for some of these association health plans and using that as a way to try to solidify some of the reimbursement. That makes sense. Right. This is just, again, more moving away from traditional insurance. That's exactly right. I mean, Maybe there'd be more negotiation for value-based payments, other right. innovative arrangements as as these association health plans um, can have more power within the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like the theme of today's podcast is shifts in the marketplace, and that's probably been a theme in healthcare for what feels like quite some time now. But between Amazon and, and various associations getting involved or more involved in healthcare, they're just continuing to shift shift the business. Well, thanks, Courtney. This concludes today's podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you have questions, comments, or have topics of interest you'd like us to cover in the future, please contact us. I'm Ann Hollenbeck at ahollenbeck at jonesday.com. And I'm Courtney Carroll at ccarroll at jonesday.com. Don't miss out on our next edition. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Jones Day Talks. Comments heard on Jones Day Talks should not be construed as legal advice regarding any specific facts or circumstances. The opinions expressed on Jones Day Talks are those of lawyers appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the firm. For more information, please visit jonesday.com.